So relax for a moment. Pretend that you are uh, Martians from another planet, green Martians, that is, and, and you're looking down and, and, you know, my God, what is that country, Canada, doing? Well, here it is. Here's the resource, bitumen. As you notice, there's no oil floating on top of sand here. Um, bitumen is an extremely dirty hydrocarbon. It's a third grade hy hydrocarbon. It's locked in sand and, and, and clay. It's a badly biodegraded resource. And uh, if you even were to go to the petroleum uh, uh, you know, guys and say, okay, well, how would you rate this thing? Say, well, we, we rate it right at the bottom. And why do we rate it at the bottom? Because it has an, a gravity of six to eight and light oil has a gravity of 40. You know, and as industry, they don't like to use the word dirty, but they'll use the word, you know, this is difficult. This is difficult stuff to work with. And so really, I it is so difficult, in fact, that really the tar sands are perhaps the GM of oil production in the planet. <laughs> um, now, we know it, 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 uh, the resource is, f is phenomenal. It, it does occupy an area the size of Florida in, in, in northern Alberta. And Alberta is actually proposing to industrialize that entire area. And, we're, and, and, and by that, I don't mean we're going to have an open pit mine the size of Florida. Well, I'm sure the Alberta government would consider it. But really, w w I it's uh, only 20 percent of the, uh, a very small portion of the landscape, about 3,000 square kilometers, is, is devoted to open pit mines. The rest will be fragmented with, with other ways of, of producing bitumen. Now, the key driver to all this, of course, is the United States. The United States is getting tired of, of, of subsidizing insurrections against uh, the United States by buying oil from the Middle East. And so they want to get off bloody oil and on to dirty oil. And we have been, for the last seven years, the number one supplier of oil to the United States. We long ago surpassed Saudi Arabia, now we have surpassed Mexico. Mexico's oil is in steep decline. And uh, this has been a dramatic change. You can't become the number one supplier of oil to the world's mightiest empire without changing your economy and your politics and your outlook on life, especially when there's been no preparation for this. Now, a lot of the oil, a lot of the, pit the, b the bitumen that we produce, the majority of it actually, is going to the United States, and the vast majority of that is going to what is known as Pad D or Petroleum Administration District 2, which is where Barack Obama comes from. That's the Midwest, the states of Illinois and Michigan and uh, the Dakotas in Minnesota. And we know that Obama has a few opinions about oil. He knows that it's draining the American dream. And he knows that it's no longer sustainable, and he calls it dirty, dwindling, and dangerously expensive. And in Canada, we're thinking, okay, all right, the Americans are thinking twice about it, this, what are we going to do? Uh, and we described the bitumen, by the way, as a global resource, which is, you know, complete hubris. We only have one market, and that's the United States. But, you know, we're dreaming. We're going to put a pipeline across British Columbia, and we're going to have 300 super tankers come up to the West Coast, and we're going to export this bitumen to China and Asia and to India. That's the dream. But in order to do that, we're going to have to drill the natural gas fields in the Mackenzie Valley and empty those in order to keep the tar sands running because the tar sands run on natural gas. And right now, 50% of the nation is running on bitumen. But it's not this part of the nation. Atlantic Canada is still dependent on oil from the North Sea and from the Middle East. Half of the oil you consume is coming from the Middle East. Yet, you have provided the workforce for this project. In the last 10 years, 340,000 Maritimers have left Atlantic Canada to work out west in Saskatchewan and Alberta in, an hydro in the hydrocarbon boom. That's 14% of your population. You go to a place like Fort McMurray, which has experienced Chinese-scale growth, 9 to 12% growth a year. Population has doubled in a decade from 30,000 to to uh, approximately 80,000, enormous. And with that have come all kinds of social problems, which I won't talk too much tonight about, but the, the, the pages in, 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 in the yellow pages, the number of escort services listed has gone from one to 14. This one I found rather amazing, Hummer ladies, only in Alberta. Um, <coughs> now the project at the same time has given us a petrodollar. You know, our dollar now goes up and down with the price of oil. 
And with that petrodollar, we need a petro premier, or a petro uh, prime minister. And you know, most Canadians forget that Stephen Harper is the son of an imperial oil executive. His dad was an accountant who worked for imperial oil. And now, if, if, if you lived in Alberta, as I have for 20 years, you also know that Stephen Harper does not really believe in climate change. It's not part of his vocabulary. Most of his friends <laughs> were members of the Friends of Science, uh, uh, you know, a group that has spent a lot of money and a lot of time trying to, to convince Albertans that, look, this is inconvenient. We don't have to worry about this stuff. Now, this project has become so large and so huge and you probably can't see this, but the top line is the investments in the manufacturing sector, and then you have oil sands development coming up to meet it in 2006. So the level of investment in the country in the oil sands was the same as our manufacturing sector in 2006, which is a disastrous development, and as a consequence, uh, the manufacturing sectors of Ontario and Quebec have suffered mightily as a result of this petrodollar and all of this money going to this project. Of course, we have this, you know, this uh, problem with uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions, and you know, a third of the emissions now of Canada's emissions are coming from Alberta. Our approach so far is, is that we've, we've, in the last 10 years, had 10, uh, excuse me, uh, approximately 10 different programs for, for climate change. We've spent more than $6 billion, and all we've really done is burn a lot of money, as Mark Jacquard would say. And in the process, of course, we're heating up the planet. And because we're using so much energy and we've, you know, we're thinking, oh my God, all these greenhouse gas emissions, what are we going to do? So we've got some really bright minds in the country that are thinking the solution here is nuclear power. And so we're hearing about proposals to put nuclear plants in Saskatchewan and Alberta, not to get us off fossil fuels, by the way, but to accelerate fossil fuel development, which would make Canada an incredibly distinct entity in the world. We're also beginning to see in the pages of the National Geographic, no less, how messy this project is. We know that, you know, it, uh, um, Jim showed you what the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, where, where it places Canada. Here's the Conference Board of, of Canada, not a terribly radical organization, you know, putting us also at the bottom, giving us a, a C for, for our environmental performance. And then at the same time, you're going to say, okay, well, aren't we getting rich? Aren't we getting wealthy from this project? Well, you know, where here's a, a graph showing you the, the, the nations with sovereign funds, and Canada's not on there. Uh, Norway is, though. And here's Norway with a sovereign fund, a pension fund worth $400 billion that it has saved for future generations. And here's Canada. This is the size of our sovereign fund. We've spent every nickel and dime we ever made out of the tar sands. And Ottawa has made more than $60 billion since 1996. And as a consequence of this rapid development, we have companies like Shell saying, oh, maybe there is something wrong with developing a resource as quickly as we have, especially something as dirty as bitumen, if we don't do anything about climate change and if we don't conserve fossil fuel spending at the same time. Is it, and maybe, just maybe, we'll become the subject of you know, uh, powerful water and climate lobbies. Well, that, that's exactly what has happened. Now the other thing in here, and I noticed, I noticed th 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 this is Colin Campbell, and he's talking about peak oil, and he's very dramatically trying to show you what peak oil is all about. You start with a full glass of beer, and before you know it, it's half, half empty, and then you know, and then it's gone. And uh, I noticed last night some serious depletion taking uh, taking place. Uh, uh <coughs> a healthy activity, I might add. And um, but but this is it. We've used up half of the best stuff, the cheapest stuff. And it's like the cod stocks, right? We got all the biggest fish. And now we're after, you know, the crummy stuff. And, and, and don't fool yourself. This financial meltdown that we are in right now is very much tied to oil and oil prices and the way that oil has created wealth in our economy for the last 150 years. And all of that is changing. And the other thing to remember about oil is, is that it has pretty much fueled the dr dramatic population growth we've seen on this planet. You know, things were going along okay until oil came al along, and then we really started multiplying. You know, this was Viagra for the human species. Now, I want to talk a bit about how oil hinders democracy, because that's something environmentalists don't talk much about. Um, but it's very much a fact, and it's very real. It's as much real in the Middle East as it is in Canada or the United States or Venezuela or Russia. 
for Nigeria. And basically, uh, one of the principles is, is simply this. Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, has, has noted, you know, as the price of oil goes up, the pace of freedom moves in the opposite direction. And as the price of oil goes down, there are opportunities for democratic debate. And there is a small window that is open now that is absolutely critical.